There are many types of kitchens that you can have when you uh, start out on your own. And one of the main ones is going to be a crappy kitchen. And that's usually because most of us have to start somewhere and we have to start out with minimal budgets. And that means cheap apartments. Some of them run down, some of them very old, and many of them out of date. And what that means is a term that I came up with about 40 years ago. Um, it was a holiday. It was either Christmas or New Year, uh, Easter. My middle sister decided to make a, a cake, or in this case, either a Yule log or a uh, bush de Noel, uh, which is a Yule log, or the Easter version of the same thing. Basically, it's a chocolate log made uh, as jelly roll as the base. And basically, for those that don't know what a jelly roll is, it's like a sponge cake with a frosting, usually a chocolate buttercream type frosting that's spread over and then the whole thing is rolled up. Basically, it's a thin layer cake baked in a baking sheet very similar to what you see right here. Difference is, this, it would be just the, the, key, uh, the cake batter poured into it and floured and everything else, of course, to keep it from sticking. But that's what it is and you take your buttercream and you put it over the top and you roll from this end to that end. You take two of them, marry them together and you have yourself a Yule log or a Bush de Noel. It's a French term, it's a French dessert basically. And um, she decided to make this based on an article in either Gourmet Magazine or in Bon Appetit. Don't remember which. She was at that time a fairly young bride, meaning she'd only been married three or four years, two or three years at the time. Um, she was married in early 1978 to her first husband, had had, I think, both children by that point. And um, as a result, she uh, and her husband, Gary, were still living in places that were old, like my house, like you see here. And, um, but the kitchens were not as nice as this. Now, when I moved into this kitchen, I didn't have this. The refrigerator, which was, was a different model, didn't match. It was almond. It was ugly. It was from the 90s. Sat right there. Otherwise, and the, otherwise, the kitchen was pretty much as you see it today. Difference being, I didn't have the dishwasher at that point either. Otherwise, it was what I would term a crack of a kitchen. And I'll show you a picture of that as well. <clears throat> Anyhow, I'm getting ready to make this recipe called Roasted Pear and Chocolate Chunk Scones. Now, the scone recipe is a little different from your typical scone recipe. The recipe came from Deb Perlman of Smitten Kitchen. Uh, I first made it back in 2012. And um, was going to make it for uh, Christmas that year, but my sister politely declined. And I think I, I pulled the recipe right at the end of the year and made them for myself. Anyhow, I haven't made them since, and so I've got some pears over here that were given to me a few days ago, and I need to use them. So I'm taking two of, uh, three of the pears and have cooked them, roasted them, and now they're going to become part of the scone recipe. But what I'm going to show you is how I work in less than ideal kitchens. As you notice, my pantry space is on the opposite side of the room from everything else, the prep space. So what you need to do is to use your kitchen in a way that works for you, but be aware that you may need to stage things before you get to the next step. It's all part of going back to mise en place or um, things have a place and every place has a thing which also means organization, which means you get what you need, your, your ingredients, you place them here, and then you can bring them over here as you need them and put them back. And this saves a step. So I'm going to show you, um, I've got flour, 
um, sugar. And I got a, oh, baking powder. Got salt over there. Need vanilla, most likely. I'm thinking about what I need and just haven't looked at the uh, recipe, which would be the other thing is to read the recipe all the way through. And let's see, got baking powder, and I got the sugar, flour, and I've got the pears already taken care of. This is unsalted butter. Otherwise, you would just eliminate the salt from the recipe. Six tablespoons of that. Heavy cream. I've got the ice, uh, bittersweet chocolate. That's 60% cacao, bittersweet from Ghirardelli. Two large eggs. Let me grab a bowl. I'll uh, use this. Now you notice I'm gathering everything. You should do that whether you have a great kitchen or a not so great kitchen. Put all of this over here. wash a whole bunch of other stuff but for now this will work What I'm doing is not so much making it easier to soften the butter because <coughs> you don't really want to soften it, but this, this will make it a little easier to incorporate into um, whatever you're doing. Great thing to have. A bowl, put the chocolate in. I think that will work. Quarter cup or three ounces or 85 grams. So here is where the scale comes in.
38 grams. That's getting there. How many grams? 85 grams. Close enough. Now one thing um, Deb Perlman does is that she includes not only gram weight but ounce weight and the volume weight, the volume measurement. There. That will go over here. Now you notice I'm staging everything by on the, the table. And you, you do want to do that for everything. Open up containers if you can, if you think to. All right. Next, as you can see, this is how, I'm not going to show you how to make the scones because that's really not the subject of the recipe, but I'm just using it as an example of how you go about staging everything so that when you get ready to cook, you just grab from here to here because everything's way over there. This is the epitome of what you got to do in small kitchens. Cracks of kitchens, anything of that sort, and you can make anything you really want to make. You just have to make sure you have the right tools and figure out how to utilize your space as it is. And as a result of that, as you can see, I've got everything on scale right there. All I have to do is reach scale, put it back on this cutting board, and continue making the recipe. I may have to pull out the uh, mixer, but I'm going to read the recipe before I get going. And this is the kind of thing that my sister had to deal with when she made that Yule log, or Easter log, whichever you want to call it. Um, because it depended on whether it was done during Christmas time or Easter depends and I don't remember because like I said I was I think maybe in high school when I came up with the term but it perfectly described what kind of kitchen she had and I'll explain that as I go through the video anyhow I'm going to shut this down and make these before it gets any later it's now almost three o'clock it's been wet and cold and very winter like all day and we've even had snow mixed in with the rain here and there and everywhere else so it's not pleasant out there I still got later to go take care of a friend's dog bring him home and come house sitting him for about 10 days and take care of a few things at their house and then I've got dinner for all ready for tonight and I go into work tomorrow so it's gonna be a busy week but I'm gonna get this out of the way while I've got it done I was given the pears and they're right on the edge of of ripeness now. So I wanted to use them while I still can. And we'll go from there. Anyhow, um, this is how you do it. This is how you kind of work with space like this. And you just plan it. And you just plan to kind of do things, move things to a spot. 
and then once you get everything together and then you just start cooking the process. Here is a, a photograph of the act, not the actual kitchen that, that Gary and Ellen lived in, but a kitchen in a similar configured uh, living or, or apartment that Gary had. Gary's uh, apartment happened to be on the ground floor facing south, it was on an outside unit. And um, And his unit was basically the flip-flop opposite of this one. This one, uh, <clears throat> the living room was, would, would, when you came into the apartment, the living room would have been to your left, or to your right, instead of to your left, like in Gary's apartment. So you come in, bathroom to your right, bedroom straight ahead, living room to your left. And this one is, like I say, it's the flip opposite of that. So you come in here, and you have the kitchen right here. Gary's, the opening would have been right here. Anyhow, uh, this would have been, this is basically the way I think the sink was over here, and you know, it was flip-flopped. Maybe not. Anyhow, this is like many uh, apartments built in, during those, that time. There were subtle differences between the building, uh, between each unit, simply because of the, uh, the fact that they were all built on site, cabinets designed and built on site. And while they tried to keep them the same, they obviously aren't going to be exact. Anyhow, this is um, this one here has had the uh, counters replaced, and I think the sink at one point may have been replaced with something back in the 50s or 60s. But the basic kitchen had not been um, gutted and redone otherwise. And these units also still have their, their uh, central steam heat or I think circulating hot water. See the steam or, or circulating hot water, but anyway, they still have the radiators. <clears throat> As you can see, they uh, whoever owns this unit did a smart thing by um, adding you know, storage, counter space to uh, to put things. This is a, a close up of the sink area. As you can see. The faucet was replaced, and it looks like it could be uh, be one designed. It's for a hospital or medical facility, but instead it was it's for the home. But anyway, um, about the only thing they they have done, I think, over time is replace the light fixtures and I think updated the wiring. These may have may have. Uh, circuit breakers in them now instead of fuses. Anyhow, this is the type of place, type of kitchen that Gary had when they, when he lived here. Here we go. This is <clears throat> another example. This is actually the layout of what he had difference being this one still has its original counters and they just redid this area down here cut it out and gave it open storage for vertical storage of baking pans and all that stuff up here is uh, you uh, you have cabinets and I think this I can't tell if this was original cabinet or whether it was re never put in, or if it was taken out, or what the deal is. It looks kind of like a detail here. Um, and it's the broom closet and everything's here. I wish I grabbed the second picture that shows a little bit closer in of, of the stove and refrigerator. 
anyhow, this unit is a little more, uh, I think it's a little more original as it still has its original uh, light fixture. Anyhow, this is, is charming. I quite like this because they extend out and they have an actual prep space, extended prep space for baking or whatever the case may be. So, um, yeah, this is another example, and this is more because you can see the doorways right here. And this gets you into the kitchen. This is the, um, the funky kitchen that they moved to after living on Capitol Hill for about a year. The building, I'm going to guess, was built in uh, 1890s, probably. Down in the regrade, or that Denny regrade, which is really just a flattening of Denny Hill. And Denny Hill, um, in places during the, the regrade, in some parts of even the 70s, there were areas where the properties were a couple of stories above the, the ground and you had to go up steep stairs to get to the building. In their case, you went in through an alleyway to a gravel parking area and that led you to the building itself. There were four units. The two upper units had external exterior stairs that allowed the tenants to get up to them. They happened to live on the ground floor on the left-hand side. So you just a couple steps up to the back porch and you were at their back door, which led into the kitchen, as you see here. The refrigerator was right here and it was a, a Frigidaire Imperial refrigerator. The Imperial line was the top of the line back in the 50s and 60s. The stove was over here and I don't rem remember what vintage it was. And the uh, counter and cabinet <clears throat> and sink probably dated, you know, uh, probably dated to the late 40s, early 50s, I'm guessing. It's been over 40 years since I've even been to, into the place. I have no idea if it's even still around. But uh, the cabinets were already, I think, old by the time they were renting the place. I remember Ellen had the table here, and she may have had uh, bookshelves here for extra storage. This w led into the hallway to your left. Anyhow, that was what they had to live with at the time. And, um, of course, they had a window here. But uh, this was it. This is what they, what they had to live with for about a year. They moved out when it was discovered the place was infested with fleas. And fleas were calling on Andrew, and she was like, I'm not having any of this, and they moved. They moved from that to um, this place. This place, located in, on, uh, was located in, the, in an area, I think, known as Westlake. It was up on the hill just off of, of Dexter. And when we pop back up to Street View, this is the street that they came off of, that they lived on. And this was Dexter Avenue, this place. And this was a funky place. You came in the back door because it was easier to get to. And you have... Uh, Original cabinets with, I think, upper cabinets. The refrigerator sat down here, and the stove was back over here. And she used the dining table, um, kitchen table, basically, to uh, as as a stage for cooking and placing things, kind of like what I do in my kitchen. But it's also made for eating, and she would. She made that kitchen work, but to get into the kitchen and to use the bathroom, like my bathroom, it's off the kitchen. You come in here and you do 180 degrees through another door to get to the bathroom. Then you take 180 degrees to your left and you went through a doorway that led into a, the center bedroom, what I call the center bedroom, which is where 
uh, my niece and nephew were living, were slept. And then you go through another door into what would, would have been Ellen and Gary's bedroom, <clears throat> slightly larger, I think, in size. And then that room opened up into the dining room, which uh, then opened into a living room kind of through a semi archway. And the living room and dining room had windows that looked out back towards Lake Union and uh, Capitol Hill to the east. And you can see the cathedral from their uh, St. Mark's Cathedral from their living room, which was kind of cool. But they had to move out because the, the place was going to get torn down and condos built, which if you go back here. Those were it. Anyhow, that was where she lived. Um, where they lived, and but the kitchens that she lived in were, were what she made, what I term cracks of kitchens. And I gave that term because of, of an image, an image that she uh, saw in either Bon Appetit or um, Gourmet Magazine for a Bush du Noel or Yule Log or its Easter equivalent. I can't remember which. Either way, um, she made this thing and she could have made it in one of those kitchens or she could have used her mother-in-law's kitchen. Now, at the time, her mother-in-law, her ex-mother-in-law, now deceased, and I think her ex-father-in-law is deceased as well. Um, they were living in University Place, which is a community just west of Tacoma, and I grew up there. And they lived just up the hill from the, both the junior high and high school um, campuses. And the house was built either in the late 50s or early 60s. So she may have made it there. But she could have also done it at her house. A little more challenging and a little more, um, yeah, it was a little more challenging for her to do it there. But she could have done it at either place. She was one, she's one of those people that didn't let any of that kind of thing stop her from cooking good food. Unlike a lot of people today, that be, you know, is the case. But she was not one of them. She gradually got better kitchens as she moved on. They were not necessarily uh, fancier, but they were just better laid out, a little bit more you know, uh, storage, etc. And were a little bit more usable for, for cooking in. But they were, they were all kitchens. They were just mostly older. But either way, she made this, these, these cakes, and I remember being impressed by them. And that's where I came up with the term. Just couldn't believe that she would she could cook something that fancy in a crack of a kitchen. But some people are that way. And back in the before um, in kitchen standardization, that was that was quite common. Anyhow, that's where she lived, and. Next up is going to be where I, the, some of the first places I lived in, and I'll show you some examples of cracks of kitchens elsewhere. This is uh, my first kitchen. I only lived here six months, but it was six months um, in, of interesting uh, living in the, in the place. The kitchen itself barely existed. Yes, it had a stove, and yes, it had a refrigerator, and yes, it had a, a sink. But that was basically a living, uh, sleeping space cobbled into a rental unit, full-service rental unit, and it was probably what they call a single-room occupancy, where you had a, a cooktop and a, a place to, to prepare a meal, 
but it was updated probably in the 50s or 60s, probably in the 50s, judging by these cabinets and by the, the age of the stove. Um, but anyway, it was in an area by the window, and each room was a little different. These were what I would consider the, uh, these were the inside single room occupancies. There were six of these, three in each side of the hall. And on the ends, the individual rooms were combined to make a larger one bedroom. And uh, with the front ones having uh, bay windows. Anyhow, this is the other side of the kitchen. Basically, the stove is right here. There's the sink. That was the that was the counter. That was it. This was the the only closet in the whole place. Like I said, it was a single room occupancy. And the rest of the room was just living sleeping. Fun living there. Even the outlets didn't have proper grounding. Anyhow, that was my first place. Then this is my second place. It's down in Medford. Medford, Oregon. This is actually the first of the two units I lived there in there. And I only lived there for about six months. Or for a few months. Uh, moved down in August. July, August. And... Lived here for about two weeks and then found a better place because the place I was looking in to rent uh, was taken by the time I could get back to it that same day. Anyhow, this was this is the, the kitchen. You came in through the door that was right off here. The refrigerator was off to your immediate left. The stove was right here, brand new. There's a little gas stove. You could tell the counter was a little bit higher than normal because it, the stove normally would be right about the height of the stove. And it was just sort of cobbled together. Um, anyhow, that was that. And this is the upper two upper cabinets. As you can tell, the place was pretty funky. Old and... Um, not in what I would call the best of shape. The ceiling probably had asbestos, you know, tiles laid over the, the uh, cracked plaster. Um, this was the, uh, basically the main room, and then there was a bedroom. It was a two-room flat. The bathroom down the hall, anyhow. Uh, this was my second place. This is where you, you came into the kitchen, and this was another 1920s apartment not as charming as the place Ellen and Gary lived in but it had its charms of, of its own and yes that is the original fuse box not circuit breakers but fuse um, you came in there and then to your left of the stove was this which was plenty of gracious storage just in that space alone. And to the right of the stove, you have the sink. And this is where I used for um, drying dishes. And I think I had cutting boards and things right in here. Might have had the knife walk there too. I don't remember. Um, this used to be a refrigerator. I don't think it was a, a nice box, but I think it was an actual refrigerator. And you can see evidence of where what they used to have um, insulation in the door, as well as um, mechanical cooling unit in the back, it had long been replaced, taken out years ago. This, uh, this is a cooling cabinet. I used both of these for pantry storage for food. And then here is another angle of the same area end. And as you can see the window, it's right here. And then the refrigerator. The refrigerator did not have, um, was not self defrosting. Now the kitchen did not have um, any kind of uh, radiant heat 
radiator, but it did have a riser pipe that provided some heat into the kitchen. You just I just pulled this down and put a, a slipboard, one of those particle board slipboard shelves in shelving in. I think at the time I could get them for about twenty bucks back in the nineties. I think they're about twenty dollars now. They're not expensive, and as long as you kept water off of them, they were fine for place to put cookbooks, or whatever, in a small spot. Anyhow, that is that, and this is the upper cabinet to the right of the stove. And if you take a look, I took these doors out by pulling the pins. I tried to unscrew the hinges, but they were not easy to, to remove. So I just pulled the pins and then stored the doors and then put them back when I moved out. Anyhow, I took them off because they're so wide um, that if you go back to this, it was a broom closet slash storage. And there was not a whole lot of room in there. And so I was fi I found myself ducking behind under these doors to get to whatever was in the cabinets, which was plate dishes and glassware, etc. Anyhow, um, yeah. And I had the mixer and the microwave stored down here. So anyhow, um, that was when I started making, uh, liking um, open shelving. And I, whenever I could, I utilized it. This was a great kitchen to live in or to cook in. And um, but I wouldn't call this a crack of a kitchen, but in a way it kind of borders on being a crack of a kitchen because it, it isn't real big, but it was usable. And this was my prep space right here. Now, when I moved to uh, Queen Anne Hill or Capitol Hill and had the, uh, in, in the, and that place was built in the 60s. It was an actual galley kitchen. After I moved out of some of those older apartments um, that I had lived in where the kitchens were either dismal or they were quite usable, the, uh, the 1920s studio apartment. Here is one that I lived in for the last, for 13 years. It's a, uh, essentially a, um, it was a one bedroom built in nineteen built in nineteen sixty, and it had a galley kitchen. This wall is the corner of the bathroom, so the bathroom sort of takes up the space. And right in here is where the hot water heater is for the for the unit. I got lucky; I got um, quite attractive flooring in the kitchen and the bathroom too, for that matter, and. Um, because a lot of times rental units didn't have pretty floor and they just bought whatever they could find cheap and put it down. <coughs> this is a galley kitchen, very typical of most galleys. Most galleys would probably start at this wall, would end at this wall, but this one actually extended out because there was a closet here, which I used as pantry. That's where the microwave was kept. And this is the back door that leads down the back stairs, which I never use, mostly because for much of the time I lived there, I didn't have a key to that door. I did to the front, but not to the back. And at some point they rekeyed everything and I got a key to that back door, but never needed to use it. Anyhow, this was taken one night after I cooked the meal. So it's a little messy, but you can get the idea. I had to pull out a uh, cutting board which made cooking in this little space much more usable. The toaster sat there, um, the butter was right there, all my utensils were right here, 
um, the stove. This is very. This is the electric version of the one I had um, in Medford. So, and that one was gas. This is electric, but it was a great stove for what it was. And um, in any event, this is the kitchen and how this space here became partly prep space because I was able to keep the food processor and the coffee pot on this side of the sink and then left room for staging things as I didn't need them and was through with them and I just put them right there. Just reached behind me and there it was. And over here on this side of the sink, I was able to keep the drain basket and the drying mat, cutting boards and the knife block. So it was all out of the way and yet easily accessible. It has a spot right here for hanging um, most of your pots and pans, the uh, colander, things of that nature. But as you can see, I made this kitchen work. It wasn't ideal because I could have used a little bit more space right here for prepping, but I did very well as long as I pulled out the cutting board and was able to use it for um, for cutting. And here's me making uh, anchovy biscuits. I haven't made these in a long time. These were made, I want to say we did these for mom's memorial service and the wake afterwards where we went down to the gravelers um, and had people come down. Anyhow, because uh, we had, none of us had had them for a long time. As you can see, I used the cutting board to cut them out and what have you. It worked really well for this. Like I say, it wasn't I it wasn't perfect, but it, it did surprisingly well for what it was. And that's where having a cutting board makes a big difference. Here's the actual picture I was going to show. There's black eyed peas or hoppin' john. <clears throat> which is basically black eyed peas, water, and a ham hock. Sometimes you have to make do with salt pork or fat back, or um, do what I did this year, which is using bacon ends. Works out pretty well. Although, if I had had the time to do it, I would have skimmed off some of the fat so it didn't taste quite as greasy. But anyway, that was... In the kitchen in Seattle, the the galley, but I made stuff like this all the time. And here it is, plate it up, getting ready to have dinner. Anyhow, as you can tell, I was deboning a turkey that I've been given. Um, that year for that year after Thanksgiving, and um, I was getting ready to make uh, turkey stock. <clears throat> and as you notice, the bag was sitting on the counter. I have a bowl next to it for all the meat to go into, and the bones I think were put back into another bag. Anyhow, um, and I used the cutting board on top of the pull out cutting board to work on the meat and separate it out and all of that. <clears throat> this was taken after I had um, this I think was in 2014 because I just got in the new stove I think that fall. Um, this is the brand new stove that was uh, had to replace the old one when the uh, I think the uh, the oven went out. And there, there is a photo of me working on the chicken. And this same day, I was making uh, lemon uh, brown edge lemon wafers. This is right after I think right after mom died. No, it's a couple years after mom died. But anyway, um, yes, as you can see, I don't let 
small space get in the way of whatever I'm doing. And there it is with me um, getting ready to make the cookies. And um, here we are with the, the chicken. And here is a, a close up of me um, cutting up the chicken. And there I am mixing the, the batter for the cookies. As you can see it better, that's a better look at the uh, image of the stove. <clears throat> it's just a basic hot point. At this point I had to get a little creative because the stove did not have a, a storage drawer. I think there was a version that did and a version that did not. Anyhow, um, I didn't have the drawer, so I had to buy a, a plastic shoe box and use that to put the uh, the lids in. And I just found a spot sort of between, I want to say it was between the, it was next to the microwave, if I do remember that. And it was great because I can reach over there and get a lid when I need it. And it was perfect. Like I said, you have to sometimes get creative when it comes to figuring out storage for what you need. And I put this shelf in so I have a place to set the uh, salt cellar and what have you. And at that point, I didn't really have a good spot on top of the stove like I did before on the old stove. So like I said, you just have to get creative. And I used my kitchen table for cooling cookies and all that. All right. Um, here is going to talk, show you some examples of inadequate kitchens. To further um, drive home the point of cracks of kitchens. These were places where you could prepare simple meals and store your food and um, and clean up and that was really about all you could do with some of these places now um, this place I don't rem remember where I found it on the web and I didn't make a note of it but you can see there's a wash area looks like it may be a counter here a gas stove and the refrigerator are sort of tucked into a corner and into a recess. And it just kind of looked like it was, well, here's a spot. We can put the plumbing right here and we can fit in the gas and we'll call it good. Anyhow, this is uh, just one example. This is what you would find in typical tenement of New York. And this was, building was probably, probably, I think may have been pre-law, which meant it was built in the 1830s to the 1850s. Um, because the new laws came into effect in the 1860s, if I remember right. Anyway, um, what you have here is um, a sink with hot and cold running water. Now notice there are two separate spigots. That was a common thing back in the day um, for lower end sinks. Now by the 1920s, they had a mixing line between them with, with the spout coming out between them, the hot and cold water. Otherwise, you had the two, you had, you scalded your hand on the hot water and you cooled it down with uh, the cold water. And that was basically how you mixed. They didn't have a mixer to bring the, the hot and the cold together into a single spigot or a spout in this case. Um, but this was, was common back in the day. And uh, probably as a way to um, to put kitchens and bathrooms in 
with little thought to practical use and on the cheap. And that was the end of that. Some of these uh, early uh, examples, they didn't even have the hot water. It just had a single spout for the, uh, for the cold and you just heated the water up on the stove. Here is, um, let me make it a little larger. Here is an example of an early kitchen with cabinets. This is, was probably taken in the 18, or 19, 15, 10 to 1915 time frame. You can tell this by the style of the cabinets as well as the lighting. Because by the 1920s, uh, gas lighting was on its way out. And this was clearly at a time when you could still have gas lighting. Well, gas and um, electric lighting combo, which basically, basically meant you had a gas line next to your electrical. Oop. Here's another early kitchen with rudimentary cabinets. And you can see here this the wall sink is very similar to what I saw what you saw in the tenement. Separate hot and cold spouts. Had a gas stove and this right here was, your, was an early form of hot water heating. Um, this may have been taken in the very early 1900s. And um, this was how kitchens were, like I said, this is how kitchens were done back in the day. And a lot of times you had a kitchen table that you had to um, had to work with as well for prep. Here is a couple of photos that were taken back in the 1980s um, at the time and um, this is an original kitchen to a house probably probably built in the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, at, and I think I re remember reading an article I think last year about how many of these units, many of these homes are when they when found in the 1980s were from an era where if the children didn't uh, marry they lived at home and with their parents and then when their parents died they took over the house and that was common back in the uh, 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s up until at least the 1930s this was quite common, and but anyway, back in to back to this photo here, uh, as you can see, the hot water heater was kept right near the stove. Now, what I, the reason for that may have been that some of these used the stove for the heat source. Some of these used um, it was more like a, a storage tank, and then the stove would would heat up the water. Um, Yeah, these were early hot water tanks. Don't know if it's been in use for when was the last time it was ever used or, or if it was still in use at the time these were taken. What I do know is this was a drying rack that you lowered down so the heat of the stove could dry your, your, your clothing on wash day. Electricity was added at some point. But the, the, house, the kitchen was never fully updated. Here's another example, a couple of examples, and even still has the original um, radiators. Um, again, the hot water heater was next to the stove. And this looks like a coal-fired stove. Um, and that was what they cooked on. Uh, and it would heat the, the water. And uh, as you can see, there were stairs leading up, probably the servant's, servant stairs. 
because that was the way things were back in back in the day before um, servants became uh, passe in the 40s and 50s. Here's another angle of the same room. The door is obviously newer, um, probably put in in the 80s. That it, it was was fairly new at the time. This this was shot. This was also from the 1980s. And it looked like the uh, the drain pipe had been retrofitted at some point um, with P traps. Anyhow, it had a wall sink and it had these two wooden drain boards put in. And um, and this may have been a pantry back here. Who knows? But this was the kitchen back in those days. You basically were expected to bring in your china hutch. A kitchen table and anything else that was needed otherwise you were provided with a sink and the stove or a place for your stove and you brought your stove too anyhow this is what they what was found back in the 1980s after probably the spinster died And this is an archival photo of a tenement with tenants in it from the 1940s. As you can see, these cabinets have been, been up there for a long, long time. They probably hadn't been painted in quite a while, as you can see by, the worn, by how worn the paint is around the corners of the doors. But that was how immigrants... Um, lived for many many years this was I think a bathtub when bathtubs and all that stuff were installed in the uh, in the early days of plumbing like I said a lot of these places didn't have plumbing to start with but plumbing was added after the fact and so they just put them in um, ran the lines did it as cheaply as they could do it get away with and that was that. Here is an example of a kitchen with the stove. This is probably the clearest picture I could find. Gas stove on top of a what what would have been a uh, coal-fired stove, and that was that provided heat. Now this is from the 1920 1930s because the cathedral-style radios were a 1930s um, design element. But this was what you would have had in at that time. As you can tell by the chip paint, um, this place hadn't been has was kept up just enough, and you could tell this was um, probably had some repairs done and done poorly because the walls all bumpy and cracked and whatever else. And this hutch may or may not have been original. This almost looks like a 1920s, 1930s style hutch with the uh, the filigree corners. The windows, this was a pre-war unit when it was built. And the reason I know this is because this window leads into what's the parlor. They did this to... Um, to provide fresh air into what was normally a, a window what was otherwise a windowless room in the middle of the unit many of these units um, didn't uh, had a back room that had no windows at all and they did the same thing there they just punched a hole and put a window in anyhow that was how they did the plumbing in those days as you can tell the gas line was put in and the stove was just sat on top of the old uh, cast iron uh, coal fired I think stove yep that was how people cooked in those days and this is what I would call a crack of a kitchen now you may still find something like this um, not so much in that shape but places like this can still be found even today. 
um, just a little newer, prob probably dating to the 1900s to 1930s, and um, not really updated much, and would have had uh, the bare minimum, like this would have been your counter and that would have been it kind of place. Anyhow, um, those are some examples of what I would consider cracks of kitchens where you may do with what you had. So if you like this video, please hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to subscribe, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified. It'll do this channel a world of good and I'll see you on the next one.